So thank you all for coming back. We've had an exciting morning. And um, I think what will happen this afternoon is that a lot of the threads that we've been talking about earlier today will all sort of coalesce in our program this afternoon. So, uh, so thanks for joining us again. My name's Philip Kent, and I'm a member of the IFRA, IFLA Library Buildings and Equipment section. And I'm also the university librarian here at the University of Sydney. And I've been delighted with Margie to be co-host of um, a festival of our library buildings and equipment section um, with our colleagues here from all around the world this week. Um, in planning for um, our program today, we really, on the one hand, uh, wanted to provide our if our IFLA colleagues from overseas with a, an authentic and distinctive um, experience in this region. And uh, also in terms of uh, you, our colleagues here in Australia, we wanted to share their knowledge and information with you as well in putting together the program. And so that's why this morning we uh, had a, a world view and we got off to a really good start with Annie sort of covering the whole world, which was amazing. Um, and then, but also what we wanted to do is that, uh, and I know there's great interest in this audience from talking about, you know, the distinctive Australian issues that we're dealing with in this um, post-colonial world and uh, what we should be doing here uh, in terms of library design and indeed in library services um, writ large. So um, we, we, we were lucky too that we have some um, people on our committee and very good friends, our cousins across the ditch um, in Aotearoa, New Zealand. And so we were, had no trouble putting together a program about what's happening in Australia and New Zealand. Um, we had hoped to include Canada and we do have Canadian colleagues, but uh, because of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, which Annie referenced this morning, there are big changes coming in Canada as well with very strong legislative background to them. Uh, but I'm sorry that we don't have um, a, uh, any papers this afternoon on, um, on Canada at this, at this time. But I think we've got more than enough to have a jolly good conversation this afternoon. And who better to start that conversation for us is, I need to move the, is Shannon. Thanks, Sylvia. Um, so Annie referenced Shannon a couple of times this morning, so I don't need to say much more. And, and as you know, we've got bios and you've got access to them as well. But just to say that um, Shannon is a Darawal keeper, knowledge keeper, uh, and she also has, uh, throughout her career, been involved as an interdisciplinary creative practitioner. And I think she's, um, by reputation, an effective um, agent of change in um, education and, and in design of spaces. So, uh, and also in the course of this morning, we had a couple of passing references to the um, Connecting with Country, and then this is um, a New South Wales um, initiative and, and led by the um, New South Wales architect and uh, guidance for um, people that are embarking on projects like this. And who better to talk uh, to us this afternoon um, is Shannon, because Shannon was involved and lobbied and created and helped build those, um, those standards. And I think you're also on the advisory board going forward. So without any more from me, we'll hand over to Shannon because she's got so much to tell. Thank you. Thank you so much, Philip. Can everybody hear me? Is it all right? Okay, good. <laughs> um, thank you. That was like, I feel like I may let you walk down and not be as great as... I'm sure Annie speaks so beautifully about Bangora and Philip. Thank you so much. 
Um, where do I even begin? I want to talk to everybody. So I've got a move, roaming mic, which is good. <laughs> and I do apologize. I'm recovering from, I'm not contagious in any way. <laughs> I don't have COVID um, being tested. And, um, but I just have a lingering, you know, your lungs doesn't, they don't seem to want to let up after you've been unwell. So um, and I just think I want to neglect this side over here either um, because you're actually sitting in a beautiful place to talk about education. And I'm not actually talking about the Sandstone Academy. I'm talking about under the Port Jackson figs over here. So these beautiful figs are what we call damu. Very good, Annie. I should have tested you on that. I knew you'd know that. Um, and they're a learning tree. And so the idea is if they weren't so placed so together so closely, they would grow in a beautiful canopy where the branches would actually come down and touch the ground. So country would create literally a classroom for you. And so that's where we would sit and tell stories. And it makes a perfect, um, I guess, sort of a, a, a buffer so that you're not being distracted with the outside world. Kids can climb in the trees. They can sit how they like. They can lay. They can, you know, move around if they need to. Um, but it's an incredibly important part of our story and our culture. And, and then that weaves in with a whole lot of other things. So hopefully we'll end up back at the Port Jackson Fig. But I guess I'd like to begin by saying a very heartfelt welcome to you all here on this beautiful country um, that my ancestors have walked for tens of thousands of years and a very large part of the whole connecting with country framework and the work that I do and the work that we all do as my family is about being seen, undoing the erasure, undoing the silencing um, of what's occurred. And I was raised in the perfect silent era of what we call colonisation in Australia. Um, but I guess I should probably begin by saying Wadeo Galambong Bred, which is welcome to this beautiful sacred country. Uh, we know this country is a, is a freshwater country. There's a beautiful spring that pops up just not far from here. In Victoria Park, where am I? No, that way. Yeah, <laughs> see, I don't know. <laughs> Once you put these walls around, you don't know anymore, right? <laughs> Um, but just because those walls there doesn't mean that country is not still here. Okay, country, and I'm going to go through my slides, which I'm, I've been instructed because, of course, designers have to complicate things and we have to go into, oh, hello. Um, that's our next, Kelda. Um, to any, and also I should, I've sort of messed up my welcome in a way, but I should um, definitely say, so I'm a Dorawali Yora woman, um, Yora being from this place here. And uh, I have come from a long line of amazing people. I'll show you a little snippet of that. Positioning is an incredibly important part of our world as Indigenous peoples, knowing who you are, who, what you bring to the table, why you want to talk to us, and what are your intentions for the future with what knowledge we share with you. Because we come from a very long and dark history of research that's been extractive, knowledges that have been used against us, um, the list goes on and on. I don't really want to, you know, focus on those negative aspects of what's occurred in the past, but other to than to say that there's a better way forward. Um, and part of that is how we do our work. And it's a different kind of way of working. It can be conflicting with budgets and schedules, but the outcome is so worth it. And it's not, what can I say? It's not, a, it's not an invaluable way of working and an invaluable set of outcomes that can actually, we try to focus on what we consider country, community, but necessarily commerce as well. It has to be there. It has to fund what we need the projects to do. Um, and I'm going to keep talking. I'll probably show pictures because it's going to explain it a lot better. I'm kind of super excited to be here. So I'm scattered all over the place. Um, and it was such a beautiful world. It's very overwhelming. This is my grandfather. So this is Fred Foster. And uh, he was a snake man from down La Perouse. <laughs> I tell you this, the parts of the reasons why I've been telling these stories for so long is, you know, obviously I'm a very white passing um, Indigenous woman. And I think that people think that my culture and my stories are way back when and, you know, very detached or dispossessed. I've been told all my life were extinct, that there's no Aboriginal people in Sydney. Everyone's in Alice Springs. I've heard it all every single thing. Um, and if anyone's got any curly questions that they'd like to ask, I'm the person to ask because I'd prefer you ask me than anybody um, out there in the big wide world and you might either get the wrong end of the whole situation or they might or whatever, but I will not be offended. You can say you're asking for a friend. Um, it's all good, I don't mind. 
now's the time to ask questions because I'm an educator at heart is where I really came from. I have a visual arts background. I did my postgraduate here at Sydney Uni. Um, I did a postgraduate in education. It was one of the last years of the diploma. So I squeezed it in in one year, which was brilliant. <laughs> um, but I loved it. I loved being here. <clears throat> it was such a great university being here. And it was the very first time, I was 22 at the time, and there was an Indigenous Studies course, and it was the very first time ever in my formal education that somebody looked at me and said, who are you? You're Aboriginal, aren't you? You're mob. And I said, yeah, how did you know? And it's like not ever once before in my entire life, and all my teachers knew that I was Aboriginal, they all saw my dad, and I'll show you my dad. Um, do we flick through that way? Here's my dad. That's my dad and me down there. Like there's no denying it, but in the middle of Sydney, and I live on sort of the outskirts of Bankstown on the Georges River in a little place called Panania, which is apparently an Aboriginal word that means sun rising and shining on the hills, but I think it's a desert word because the missionaries were known to bring desert words into Sydney and, and to mix up all the cultural different you know, things that were going on around all the different missions. Sorry, I don't, I don't want to digress. So this is my family, amazing people. Top left, my great-great-grandmother Kate lived in the Bowdoin government boat sheds. She's in very early colonial notes. We have apical ancestors that go way back. We know who they are. We have native title type situations right up and down the coast through my family, um, right down to the Victorian border and right up um, through Newcastle and, you know, right up that way of Foster and, and Tunkari and that. So... We're legit. <laughs> um, and, it's, and this has been a lifelong learning for me. Um, and everything that I share and I do involves everything that I've ever learned from all the walks I've done, all the talks I've done, all the information that's carried down through my father, my aunties, my uncles, everybody. I just like I could talk for hours, days, months, weeks, years for, about these people. They did an opening, my great grandfather did an opening for the, um, a corroboree for the opening of the Harbour Bridge. Uh, he was and my great grandmother were part of the 1938 Day of Mourning. Um, it just goes on and on. I can't tell you how amazing these people are. And so I, a lot of my work is about continuing the story because from this point where Tom died and Fred was still working as well, but around, you know, 40s, 50s, 60s, everything just went quiet. And, you know, when Bill Stanner said, oh, you know, the silent apartheid and it shall end here and, da, 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 and all this. It didn't end there. It just got worse. Anyway, so a lot of what I do and Connecting with Country is about showcasing, bringing to the fore, bringing back country and what it really means and the values of country, the cultural aspects of country. And I'm not and using words isn't going to explain it, so I'm going to jump ahead. This is like the other half of Wonderful Bangwara, which is Jo patterson Kinneborough. She's an architect and design professional and has been teaching through UTS for a zillion years. Um, brilliant person so she brings the architecture to the table and that design and governance story and I bring she's also indigenous she's a descendant of um, Kariaku slave she actually interestingly um, was, grew up and was raised in Aotearoa New Zealand and so she saw there what was happening and how everything was working there and came to Australia working in the built environment and went what's going on here there's no mention of anything before the architect arrives or somebody raises the thing to the ground and there's a there's a block of concrete. So everything kind of started. You might say, oh, Aboriginal people used to use canoes here. And that was sort of it. And then it had jumped straight into, so this, you know, suburb was gazetted at whatever. We met at the zoo, and I don't mean UTS. Um, <laughs> um, we literally were, at, I was doing the bird show at the zoo and she saw me and was like, oh, I need someone just like you to talk. And so we started working together. Uh, um, I'll try and so what we really do is showcase country I'm going to jump all over the place sorry about that um, country and here we're looking at like ideas around so where we are right now and I was going to explain that about country um, so the, you'll, you'll hear that it's called the Gadigal, Gadigal country your nation which it's better than nothing <laughs> but I'll say that that's and I don't want to put anybody down or disparage anything but research has come a long way and we've now got traditional owners here doing this. A lot of the knowledge that's out there is, wasn't done by traditional owners. It's a lot done by places and people that don't necessarily understand the full mechanics of culture and language. So Gadigal is, describes the Gad, like the Gaddy, which is from the Gul Gaddy, which is the Gaddy tree, the beautiful grass trees at the front of the building here. Gorgeous. It's the only place in Sydney you can find grass trees. And yet they call it Gaddy country. That's so strange. Is that not odd? You go to Western Australia and Perth and the plains in 
profit in them. And they are one of the most important plants here. And if you go to in the natural spaces, go to North Head or anywhere like that, you'll see grass, the grass trees everywhere. Ah, oh, or the gaddy, good gaddy. So gaddy is actually the flower spike. And the flower spike is used as a spear when you're fishing off the rocks around saltwater country. And that is as a very specific country is named for very specific um, meanings of, you know, what's, what's local here, what's being done here in this very spot. So where you fish from the rocks and you use that, that, that spear, that spear floats because it's actually a fibrous, it's gone woody in its sort of old age, if you know what I mean, and it floats. So if you miss your fish, you get your spear back. So it makes perfect sense, right? So that's gaddy country. Um, when you put a gal on the end, you're referring to the men. So when you say, welcome, or good day, or gaddy gal, you're saying welcome to the men of gaddy country. And I'm a bit against that because <laughs> galleen is women, gaddy galleen is women. And so um, I always like to say gaddy, good day, or gaddy country. I try, try not to make it genderized. But also this isn't, there's no, it's not salt water here and there's no rocks and there's no fishing from the rocks with the spears. When Europeans named our country, um, they went around the waterways. So you look at all the old European maps and you'll see everything named around the waterways, but nothing for places like this here, where they couldn't bring their boats up the waterways because they were too small and narrow. And so what we need to do is then let's have a look at what country is here. You know, erase all of the concrete, the steel, the sandstone, everything, and let's have a look at country. And what country here is fresh water. There are springs. There's a massive aquifer under this land here, 20 kilometres long. Beautiful spring water popping up in little spaces all over. There's a lot of, um, so we're at the top of an escarpment here that runs down to saltwater country, which we now know as Blackwater Bay um, and spaces like that. Even though it wasn't black wattles that were there, it was jeruing, which is a calicoma serratifolia, but it got, do you see how I could just talk and talk? And everything, I think I, what we need to learn from this mostly is that everything is connected. It's so incredibly hard to talk about one little thing and not go down all these rabbit holes and rabbit warrens, and I do it a lot. So somebody needs to tell me when we're getting close to the end of my time. Um, so freshwater country, Natagurad, and women's law around um, fresh water is incredibly strict. Um, it's about administering the fresh water and making sure there's always enough for medicines, for birthing, for everyday use. Um, and you'd have to ask permission for water, to use water in any kind of larger context. Um, and so it's really important what's going on here in these spaces. Uh, there was noted that there was a kangaroo ground here as well because it was kind of on top, of, as you start to get to the top of the ridge, you get those areas of grassland. So long story short, it's not really Gadigal country up here. And there's women as well. So we should acknowledge that. Um, but country is what we try to showcase in everything. And country is still here even when, um, this is actually the end of the line for the fresh water that runs from here down to the salt water. This is like around the side of the now powerhouse museum and the railway yards and whatnot. Um, and there's some little spots down there where if you walk through, you can still smell the mangroves in the mud. <laughs> because where the fresh water meets the salt water, depending on how vast the landscape is there, as fresh meets salt, it makes a brand new ecology. And that is amazing sort of philosophy and principle and value of country is the ways in which country brings very diverse elements together to create a brand new space. And it's that brand new space that has its own intrinsic value and qualities um, that you can bring into these spaces that we're creating. So thinking about things like community spaces, libraries, and all of the diverse and vastly, you know, I guess well, different things that need to come together and work peacefully together. So we have a look at how do we create these like interstitial zones and modular kind of spaces that can respond to whether it's high tide or low tide. Sometimes it's very full, sometimes it's very empty. Sometimes you need something for two people, sometimes you need something for 100 people or more. And so we look at country and we think, how does country deal with this? You know, what are the adaptations? What goes on in this interstitial zone? Here in Sydney, you will see that there's mangroves, there's mud, you know, the silt washes in and it mixes, you get the brackish water and you get this um, fertile environment that is perfect for the very beginnings of life in the saltwater system. So it's where the crabs spawn and that like on a, on a king tide and a 
big moon, that's where the sort of the cycle, it's almost like there's if there was a, it's the beginning point, that's where it would happen because the crabs spawn, the fish kind of have the eels, the birds, they all feed from the spawn and it just goes on and on and this whole cycle begins and starts churning. And these very small parts of our ecology, and that's another point I need to say is our ecology because we're part of this. We are part of country. We are of country. Um, it means that these very small parts, like the babies, the organisms, can survive without being predated upon by larger species and things. Now, I'm sort of going off down that, the country tangent, and, bring, and then I'm just going to keep trying to bring it back to how does that then is reflected in space. We talk about the spatial implications of country. Um, <laughs> that's some of our design lingo I've picked up in the last few years. It's probably going to be mentioned in here, actually. Um, this was an interesting um, project about how do you bring the ancient knowledges and contemporary knowledges and, you know, European, you know, this uh, sort of a whole different world together and showcase these stories. And that's what I love most about doing this work is that we get to showcase phenomenal stories and that we get to bring these to the fore. You know, we've been told to be quiet for so many years. So this is quite extraordinary now to be sought out <laughs> to do these talks to people who have you know, it's so much opportunity to make great change and do big things. Um, so this is the story of my great-grandfather doing the corroboree for the opening of the Harbour Bridge. Um, not far from there, right, this is like a part of the point where, and this is my grand, great-grandfather. I probably should use the car session. Oh, I've got a pointy thing, have I? I do. There. Ah, uh, where is he? Where he's holding up. Oh, there he is. There's his boomerang there. So you can see he's got his fingers in his mouth playing the gum leaf. Anyway, it's a brilliant story, and it, and I've heard this story all my life, but I didn't know it actually happened. Where is he? There he is. And I thought my family was just pulling my leg. Um, and they talked about how cranky all the men were, and somebody else walked out in front of them, and blah blah blah. And I'd never seen the photo. I'd only had a photo after he'd done the corroboree, and then one day this pops up from Fairfax, and there's the and this is out of the archives. You don't know what you've got in your boxes. Please go through all the boxes you've got in your libraries and in your spaces. You never know what you've got there, um, especially the local history sections and things. Oh, gosh, it's phenomenal. Anyway, so this, yeah, this was about um, just close to there in the harbour is a place called, a space called Bumatjuril, which is a healing space for Paradawi, the eel, and Buambali, the grey nurse shark. And so we're combining all of these stories in together of, um, and over to the left there is a place called Gorygon, which is the like a healing space for Rygon, the um, seahorse. And in amongst this project that we were doing, and which was part of the Blackwater Bay master plan that we worked on, um, was uh, they found in, oh, in another spot, Two Bays West, they found this, you know, whole community of threatened and they thought extinct um, white seahorse. <laughs> And so this whole part of the story, now that's being carried on by Alison Page, another wonderful Aboriginal woman who um, uh, has created, is creating this public art around uh, shopping trolleys, recycle shopping trolleys to make habitat. Seahorses love shopping trolleys. Did you know that? There's lots of spaces to hang on to, right? I'm just rambling now about everything, right? <laughs> You're just going to get it all. Um, and so this public art that breaches the water, but underneath the water is habitat. And it all started because we were looking around this area and going, hmm, what's here? I know there's an ancestral story from there and an ancestral story from there. The seahorse, Ryagon, is all about um, if somebody drowns in the water and we can't retrieve their body, Ryagon goes and saves and takes their spirit to the other side. And so Guraigon, which is, I believe it's called Clark Island now, is the island that is where you you know celebrate and have ceremonies for Garag and so that's where Ryagon takes his takes the spirits um and then part like so it just goes on because part of the story is Kate my great-great-grandmother lived in the abandoned government boat sheds and son little boy drowned in the water there and so there's this whole like it's so complex and interwoven with ancestral stories contemporary stories early colonial stories and notes like it's just this beautiful integrated mishmash it's sad and it's difficult, but there's so much in there that then we can bring forward. So we have sort of are trying to identify these stories and ideas and concepts that have never been heard before in some cases and that we can't imagine because we have all this concrete and everything everywhere, right? And we can't imagine there's anything um, actually happening there. Did you, did you show this today? Yeah. 
not that one. Also, this is from Rhiannon and did this. This is um, the colorway. And um, combining cultural knowledge with these beautiful ways of working and designing. Um, it's been a beautiful project to work on. Really amazing. But FJMT are also amazing at bringing our cultural knowledge and stories to life. So that helps a lot. Um, and this whole process of connecting with country, it's very like it's a great like professional learning development, right? But on a personal level, to know these things about where you're from and the country you're on, the history, the contemporary uses, who's here now, what's going on now. There's so much out there that I think most people wouldn't know even was happening um, unless you know where to look and where to go and see and, and connect. Um, oh, sorry, did I can take a photo of that? <laughs> and um, no worries. Uh, North Head, these are nearly finished now, actually. These are some lookout sites from up there. Um, but this was about connecting to country there. And one of the most important things there is the little bandicoot. So the bandicoot is extinct across Sydney, except for this one and big like presence colony up there on North Head. It's huge, and there's evidence of them everywhere. And so, what people don't know about so little the little guy that we call him Baraga um, is the bandicoot, and Baragula is the name for the sunset. And from up in this southern lookout, the sunset is extraordinary. If anyone's seen it, it is beautiful. And it's what everybody goes there for to see the sunset, Baragula. Baraga is the animal that is present at the time of Baragula. So that's how these links come in, unless you know that. So that lookout's now called Baragula. Could give you a god complex when you think about naming places, but it's not, I mean, this is not on me as an individual. This is stories from my family and all of us. Um, so that's the southern lookout. And then there was also a northern one, Yining Ma. But we can keep, I won't go into too much. There's the 1938 day of mourning march. We reenacted it with some students, had a great time, but um, yeah, looked at the politics of, of space and, you know, like these people weren't allowed to walk in the front door, they had to walk up the back door, the back steps. It's very involved. It's all about the margins. It's, it's just like, it's an incredible story on a world scale even, because this is, this happened, this is a protest that happened over 20 years before Martin Luther King Jr. and Rosa Parks and everybody that we know of from other places but nobody knows that this happened or very few know or understand what happened here in Sydney in 1938. And it was a protest, obviously, um, for a day of mourning on the 26th of January. So people like to say that we just made it up now that we don't like the 26th of January, but it's been going on for a long time. It's just no one's been listening. Um, and so we've, we, uh, you know, one of the, I mean, our, the files are littered with things that you don't win, right? But um, we actually love doing these things. So there was a project that we were going for near the War Memorial on Liverpool Street. Uh, you may wonder what this has to do with library design, but I'm going to get there. Um, and so <laughs> these buildings were being redesigned. What people didn't realise, so at the back of this space, there was a bit of a pocket park and the laneway. And guess what was just down the laneway? The back doors that my great-grandparents had to walk up to get into Australia Hall on Elizabeth Street there. And so it was just the perfect story of the warriors of our resistance here and the warriors of your resistance there. And this conversation that could be had, you know, this two-way and this space, this reflective space here that you can create. And it was actually quite quiet back there. Like you're in Liverpool Street, like it's the middle of the city. But thinking about those ideas, and so this was some of the renders from that and allowing country to breathe again in this place and sort of real country, not hyper landscaped country, preferably. Um, we're pretty against introduced species for the most part. The only thing I can sort of really sort of get my head around, I love the idea of fruit trees and that you, people could just eat from walking down the street, that there's free food available. That's what country is about. You shouldn't have to pay for resources from country. Unfortunately, a lot of people take more than they, they need way more, <laughs> a lot more. So that's it's a difficult thing to do now is to be able to let country provide however it provides. I'll probably skip on past this. This is a bit of a, it was testing the limits of City of Sydney have a clause now, a bylaw that says, leave Aboriginal people alone. They can enact culture however they want within the City of Sydney bounds. And so that could be busking. It could be having a smoking ceremony. It could be doing whatever. It was literally, actually, it was quite strange because it was just a couple of months before that whole thing happened with the statues. And we would have got in some awful, awful trouble if it was at the same time. I'd like to see that one go to court, though. Okay. 
Um, this is, yep. Oh, good. I'm going to start wrapping up now oh, around the country. Okay. Kinship is important. You'll notice this is all sort of coming under some categories. I just want to jump to one of my favourite. I like this one too. It's poetry in the ground at Sydney Olympic Park. You know, think about every single surface, every single part, our stories, our knowledge, but country especially, like time is running out. This, you know, we need to prioritise country in any way we can. And it's got to come before the bottom line dollar as well because too long now we've been putting money first and I think we're starting to realise that we can't eat, drink or breathe money. Um, I, I, you know, Albanese, I love him, but I, he said a few months ago we can't put plants before people. And, but they keep you alive. You have to put them before people or we're all gone. So I'm like, I just don't think people are getting it. Now, this, I loved doing this job. This was a gentleman's library <laughs> in the um, Museum of Sydney. So a very conservative, very colonial. It's on the location of the very first government house and it's a very incredibly colonially based building what they wanted though was a space where they could have indigenous education and it, this was our first job ever as Bangawara um, and it just so happened that because I've been in education for a long time I've been writing programs for a long time so they saw us to do the space and then I happened to say did you know that I can do all this as well so we got to do right education programs and everything for this whole space and it was just it was awesome but it was a learning curve biggest thing I learned was don't ever show the client anything you don't like yourself because I didn't like that painting that ended up on the carpet. I liked other ones, but that one slipped through. And then, oh, we like that one. Damn. So the other ones were better. But it's a printed carpet. <laughs> and the I know is not funny. The idea is, though, that you're in the middle of the city. You have students coming from everywhere. Where's country? And so we've recreated a campsite. It's around Aboriginal pedagogies of being able to lay down and learn together in a circle. There's no sage on the stage. And so there's a, a stellarium and that speaks to different constellations in the sky and there's an audio that we did of me telling the stories of that so the students can lay down and look and it's about, you know, there's the fire and the earth and the water and, you know, thinking about these different ways that we do things. It's not just about um, what something looks like, but it's about how do we act in these spaces? How does it perform? How do we perform when we're there? How can we create spaces that actually speak to and with country? Another classic one of that. That's another long story. I probably should end there, but this is Ancestral Stories and the most contemporary robot cooker arm, 3D printing clay and clay mud. This is down in the mud. It's in the Olympic Park, one country. And it just, yeah, it's telling the stories, but through the mud, literally and figuratively. Um, I don't know if I've, because there's so many rabbit warren around holes to go down. And um and I mean, it's just difficult. How, what can I say to fit everything in? <laughs> Is there anything that I should have thrown in that I didn't? What did you talk about this morning? Is there anything I should say? The whole world. The whole world. It's like that. I could just talk forever. But you've got such a beautiful role in understanding how country can, you know, meaningfully be included in spaces that can then lead to conversations, to research, to other things. We're working on a library at the moment where we've got a big problem. Um, there's mermaid pools down in Southwest and people are dying there. We have a story that belongs there, our ancestral stories of Mikadan, Mikadan who um, female fish, mermaid spirit, but fish head, um, human legs. And uh, what happened in the story was people took to, men took too many fish, destroyed the fish stock there, which were her children. She retaliated killed the men. It sounds terrible. It's awful, right? The problem is, is that now when men go there and swim, they will die. So there's been 13 deaths of men, one death of a woman. And we can't get this story out enough. It's an incredibly dangerous place. And we don't want people to die there. And in the library, we've now got the opportunity to showcase that story and be able to tell the story to even to the little ones, you know, with some obviously appropriate discretion. But um, from the very youngest age, they will know because it's the teenagers that are going there and being silly and getting killed and so the library is an important space where a lot of the community will come together and be able to read and, and be informed of things that you may not be able to inform them of out there on country or on the natural parts of country and now remember when you're connecting with country you are country you are country it's not the natural versus the built anymore we are the natural world we are country so remember that connecting with country is connect to yourself 
We all know how great it feels when we go out there and connect with country, right? And that's what we need to do. Let's even the balance a bit between the concrete. People talk about green corridors. I talk about grey corridors. I'd like it all to be green with some grey corridors in it. Not all grey with some green corridors. And stick to the endemic plants and species, not just native but endemic to that spot that you're at because that then supports ecologies, habitats, things that are already there needing support. I could just go on for hours. I'm so sorry. You can follow me on LinkedIn and if you want any more information, we have a chapter in a book about the very first line that we ever worked with, somebody from the government architect said, what do you think about the idea of site? And I said, it's not a site, it's a song line. So that's how our chapter starts. So think about it that way and think about country as an entity, as a person. That's what I've been raised with. And once you realise that everything's connected and everything you do to country you're doing to yourself and to your children and to your loved ones and to the future, you start to think very differently. But I won't. Thank you all so much. Jadi Guru. Jadi Guru Gowana Mia. Thank you for remembering our ancestors today, sir. Does anyone have a question with Dr. Shannon before we move on? Who? That corner? Yes, hello. Just wait for. Thank you. Um, yeah, I just wanted to say thank you. It was a wonderful talk. Um, I guess. What would you say the biggest misconception you come across mm. about country from mm -hmm. white fellas would be? Um, probably that country is just landscaping, the plants that you choose. Um, and that or anything with country is just doing a standard um, consultation process. Um, and that, that process is actually probably pretty racist because it assumes that there's nobody of any sort of qualification that could sit at the table from the word go. Um, so that needs to be, there needs to be a reshuffling. It's a top question. They're probably my top three things. Um, and that, oh, this is the city. There is no country who cares. What, what do you mean? You know? And it's like, no, 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 no. There's plenty of ways to reverse. There's plenty of ways to go back and do it better and do it properly. Um, and it can be done for a lot of other reasons. So why can't it be done for country? The very thing that keeps us alive. That can be done because Foxtel wants a bigger satellite then it could be done because we want a bigger tree. So, because they keep us alive. And it's not just landscaping. <laughs> it's the orientation of buildings, it's windows, it's where, like where are things at? It's not, oh, some great things I've seen is, you know, some of the things we've been working on is like creating in the wall of the building a divot and planting yes. that are important within those divots. And so, and then, and then the first thing that says, well, what happens if the tree dies? There's a divot there, you better fill it. Like. <laughs> You know, you build for country, yeah, and you build so it can't be replaced. Janet Lawrence told me a great one, which she puts trees in her out, and so then they can't be cut down. They're part of the copyright and IT, <laughs> the IP and everything for like 50-odd years or more. So there's trees that, oh, we want to get rid of these cashierinas. No, part of my artwork. They've got to stay. There's another good way of doing it. <laughs> Sorry. Yes, there's another one over here. <laughs> Hi, I'm really Nicholas. Can. I'm from University Infrastructure here at UCID. Hey. Yep. Um, I got a question. Um, how do you think about um, First Nations in like a master planning sort of yes. framework? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because um, I see a lot of examples just on particular buildings and on sites. But what about the bigger picture? Yeah, there you go. There's one. Well, I don't even know if we're allowed to show this yet, but here we are. Oh. Um, <laughs> Yeah, no, I'll go back to that. Yeah, we do master planning and all that kind of thing too. And actually we find at the master planning stage it's even better because there's none of that attitude of like, oh, it's already done, it's already set, no, no, no. You start from scratch and you just you go out there on that green field or whatever and you can just go crazy. And it's amazing the ways in which people are very open and keen to accommodate country and the meaningful parts of country. Um, to, and you can see, look at these online, probably not that one yet. Oh, we're here. Um, oops. <laughs> I wouldn't normally do that. I don't think it's not allowed to be seen. Um, so, yeah, but Blackwater Bay and Bays West are online. Um, you can look at them and pick them apart. But you'll see how we do it in the master planning. And it is, it's a, it's, I mean, it's fantastic. It's even better than just, because the idea of borders and, you know, like country doesn't know borders, border doesn't know borders. Air, smoke, fire, they don't know borders. So to be able to have master plan a huge precinct is really the best way of going. 
It's made made all the difference you know so we had a series of maybe six principles that just yeah. turned all the options around in terms of you know women's yeah. business and casuarinas and yeah so that. many different parts of it that just were so um I even forget that we came into it so much later in the piece yeah and actually the people that brought us in they end up getting sort of like sidelined and saying okay we're finished with you now but we're going to continue on over yeah. here <laughs> and called us back in prescription New South yeah. Wales and it was great. It was a fantastic yeah, project. Yeah. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you, Shannon. I love the way you interweaved everything. Yeah. You made it really circular and something over here, then something over there. It just was, yeah, I loved it. But um, just a quick question. I'm representing Coffs Harbour Libraries, so Boombangi country. Yes, and I really want, I love the, the, the wording of so many things that you're yeah. bringing up. Um, could you repeat the one you mentioned yeah. about the spatial? You the said spatial the... implications of country. Love yeah. it. Love that. Thank you. No, that's okay. That's just one of the, if they're going to laugh when I say they like that. <laughs> There's one down the back there. Yeah, spatial implications. Yeah, our chapter. I'm trying to find a way to get our chapter so, so I can share it on LinkedIn because that will have a lot of lines like that. In Thanks it. so much, Shannon, for your time. Um, this is just like a pie in the sky question, or like how long is a yeah. piece of string, but. How can we do acknowledgement of country better? Yeah. So from the perspective of um, when we verbally give it, but also in our environment, in our design, yeah. when we think about country yeah. not just being yeah. um, a Western construct. Yeah. Well, I think about when I think of acknowledgement of country, I seriously mean let's think about country and acknowledge country. And so my favourite one was the one for Cutaway. It was like this channel of like, you know, the 500, 400 million years ago, a river ran here and all the sandstone was deposited and it was fused and then it was eroded and worn down and, and all of the, you know, it's just this like amazing, like think about country as it is in its natural state and talk about that. This is country that knows fresh water, salt water, this or that or whatever it is and then say, and we need, we'd like to acknowledge the people who have cared for this place for thousands of years, including, and there should never be just one name, never. And so it should, you should say like, so for here in Sydney, I say, yes, I'm Durrawal, traditional owner here, absolutely. But I'm part of a huge kinship system that also includes Darug, Eora, Gundungra, Guy Maregal, Goringa, like, you know, the list can go on. Um, and then I also say, and all of the others in our kinship system here, there's no one people, one place, one language. It's just not relevant. It's not cool anymore to be talking like that. Um, so don't ever say, I'd like to acknowledge the Mangawal people. And keep going, a little bit harder, ask around, find out. But I always put country first and anyone can write that about country. This is freshwater country under the Port Jackson figs. We find our library and da 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 da. And you know, this country has always been a place where we learn and where we teach and where we understand. We listen to the women and we da da da. You know, so that can be acknowledged and done by anybody because this is your country too. And what you know and what you connect to, you'll love and you'll protect. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Shannon. We can have to move on. Yes, please. I'm so sorry. You stay for this next session because I see what friends we've got. And as she's coming over, just very quickly introduce friend and colleague Kim Tonga from uh, from Aotearoa. And uh, Kim is very important because she is the president <laughs> of the association, the Librarians Association in New Zealand. So she's a great, as well as a, an important player in our profession, she's also a great inspiration um, to friends and what's in our GRI. So over to you, Kim. Oh, kia ora, Philip. Hi, <laughs> uh, kia ora. I would like to begin today by acknowledging the people who have cared for this place for thousands of years, your kin. In, in this beautiful country and pay my respects to your elders past and present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people here today. Kia ora, Shannon. 
um, ko te Amarangi, Amarangi ki mua, ko te Hapai Uki Muri, in, in a mana, in a reo, in a rauranga te rama, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Ko Arei Konga, tōku metua tāne. Ko Patricia, tōku metua wāini. Nō Rarotonga, e mangaia mai tōku papa, nō Ireland mai tōku mama. Ko Kim Tonga, tōku ingoa. Ko Aotea, pauarahi. Uh, community delivery kite tonga ko a hoti perahitini o te rohenga o Aotearoa. Kia ora. Uh, my, I just did my welcome in Māori as as well, and just greetings to everyone. And also uh, said in Cook Island Māori that my dad is from Rarotonga and, and Mingaia in Cook Islands, and my mum's from Ireland. Um, and in terms of work, I am the community manager, I mean, head of community delivery south for Takona Hira or Tamaki Makoto, Auckland Council, and also, as Philip mentioned, the president of um, the Library and Information Association, New Zealand, Aotearoa. Uh, kia ora. Um, my thanks to the fabulous IFLA LBES uh, section for welcoming me here today, particularly um, Philip, um, Maggie, and Marion. Uh, and so when I introduce myself, I'm acknowledging that I am not Māori. I'm here to speak about Aotearoa New, Z New Zealand and some uh, stuff that's going on in my part of the part of the library world. Um, but my whakapapa is Cook Island Māori and, and Irish, although born in Aotearoa New Zealand. So, and as I said, I'm wearing a couple of Aikatu, my presidential hat. Oh, Aikatu is the flower garland that Cook Island wear. Um, and also my Auckland Council uh, job hat. Um, so that is that is who I am, and I'm here to tell you just a little story about a little library that we have in Takanini. And I will find the thing that turns the slides on. Um, te Pātaka Kōrero o Takanini. As this is a library building and equipment uh, seminar, I will just tell you quickly about the project, but that's not really what I'm here to talk about as such and from a project point of view. This project began in 2008. It's been a long, a long journey. Um, it's a uh, very, it's 625 square meters, the library. Um, it's on a, it's actually a leased building. We did the base, we didn't do the base build. We just did fit out. Um, the base build was done by Ignite Architects and Pacific Environments was, was our lead architect. But I'm going to tell you about how we, how we have done, uh, made a whānau, that means family in, in Te Reo Māori New Zealand, um, a whānau bilingual Rio Rua, two languages, um, library, and some key, key features of the inclusive whānau-centric design. But I also would like to, with my president's hat on, just acknowledge that uh, since, and there's a first reference to um, the needs of Māori and library and information uh, work in 1963, 60 years ago, um, in one of the publications when the Library Association was working with the Māori Services Committee. So 60 years ago. So. Where we've been for the last 60 years is a topic of another uh, another talk, but I just would like to acknowledge that 60 years of mahi or work that librarians in New Zealand have done. Um, and I work with Takona Hira or Tamaki Makoto, so Auckland Council. And we are an organisation that honours our commitments to the treaty, to Te Tiriti or, or Waitangi. Um, and this is articulated through a number of key strateg strategic documents. The reason I'm mentioning this is because we sometimes forget that everything's steeped. There is steeped in the, like we have done a lot of mahi since Auckland Council began in 2010. And we've got a number of base documents that, we, that we're kind of used to working with as, as staff. And they are things such as the Auckland Plan 2050, which in focus area seven says, since 1840, Māori identity and design has been minimised in the Auckland landscape through Māori design and mātauranga Māori, that's Māori knowledge, can be, must be placed at the centre of planning, design and development. So that's our big Auckland strategic plan. In Auckland, the Auckland Council has also um, 
signed up to acknowledge the Te Aranga design principles, which came from, um, were developed by Māori design professionals in response to actually a New Zealand urban design panel in 2005. But those Te Aranga principles are, va are Māori values based. I'm just going to tell you some words and I'm going to come back to them. So, rangatira tanga, kaitiaki tanga, manaki tanga, wairua tanga, kotahi tanga, whanaunga tanga and mātauranga. We've also got in Auckland the Te Reo Māori policy. We um, are partners with the Independent Māori Statutory Board. We've got a lot of base, you know, for, for our work. So we feel really supported in that space working for Te Kaunahira or Tamaki Makoto. So I will just show you some pictures now. Um, this this is Te this is the Te Kaunani Library. Um, this is just an external shot of the base the base build that we didn't build. This is some nice pictures. We, it was a project. Um, we had some architects. We had some building going on. We've got a floor plan. However, where are we? There's a really a very average <laughs> map of Aotearoa New Zealand. Um, just so um, for those of us who oh, have I got a pointer, Auckland sort of. Tamaki Makoto is kind of there. And here is our very standard um, map of Auckland as according to council. So all those little things there are the local boards. We've got 21 local boards and one governing council. And the area we're talking about is within the Papakura local board area. However, well, it's not really, a, well, it is a however, but actually matters <laughs> is this map. So in Auckland, there are 19 manwhenua we acknowledge 19 mana whenua groups uh, and we, rec we recognise and work with 19 mana whenua groups. Um, Annie mentioned mana whenua, had a lovely, um, yeah. <laughs> what the word means, <laughs> which is um, basically iwi and hapu, which are tribes and sub-tribes with ancestral relationships to areas of tamaki makoto and exercise customary authority over that, over those areas. Um, we also work with and acknowledge Matawaka. There's a large number of urban Māori whose tribal connections are not within Tamaki Makoto. We also, of course, um, acknowledge and work with them. And I'll talk a bit, a bit later. We also, and that includes Māori organisations and Fano Māori, Māori families, basically. Or Fano, yeah. Um, so. As I said, there's 19 anywhere. If I was better at PowerPoint, I could out overlay all the 19. However, the even in the Papakura area, well, not even, but in the Papakura area, there are at least 10 iwi who acknowledge um, our mana to that to that area. Where the way we worked with this project, there's a mana whenua forum. We go and explain the project and say, essentially, not not who is interested in helping us. It's it's who would like to lead on this? And, and mana whenua talk amongst themselves, you know, just to say, actually, let's, we'll come, we'll come to the table with this one. But at the same time, at the same time, we have to absolutely talk to all 10 mana whenua groups. But in this particular instance, the leads were to Akatai Wai Ohua and Ngāti Tama Oho. So acknowledging, acknowledging particularly those two iwi for this project. <laughs> As well, is that we have done some engage a lot of engagement work. Karanga atu karanga mai um, means uh, hear the call, um, um, uh, and what I would also like to acknowledge is there's a whole lot of engagement work done too. So karanga atu karanga mai. Now these words that I've um, mentioned before come up again in karanga atu karanga mai. So these are important Māori values. Um, wairua tanga, the intergenerational links. Uh, rangatira tanga is the integrity around, um, sorry. Uh, it describes integrity of people, purpose and place. Kaitiaki tanga, stewardship, guard, guardianship. Um, it's holistically how things are connected. Manaki tanga, is often kind of referred to as hospitality, but it's really how we care for people in space and in and acknowledging them. And fanoangatanga and whakafanoangatanga is relationship building. So also mentioned in, as I'm, the Te Aranga design principles. So 
when we uh, use karanga atu karanga mai for our engagement purposes, where it's all completely based or values based on these values which are very important. Um, back to the not very good shot of the front door of Te Pātaka Kōrero or Te Kāne, but why I'm showing you this is because you'll notice Te Pātaka Kōrero or Te Kānani. So there's a couple of things here. The Pātaka, you'll notice there's a double A. So Māori has either macrons to emphasise the whichever vowel it is, or this, the Te Akatai um, iwi, iwi group, their dialect is to double A, the where the macron sometimes is in other places. So, and very importantly, Takanani is actually the name of one of their ancestors, Ihaka Takanani. And so when we met, when we were actually Kathleen, who you'll see a photo of in a moment, moment who was uh, there at the table with us, she said, if you do one thing in this build, can you please spell my ancestor's name correctly? Um, so Takanani and but you'll see on any other map of Aotearoa, it's, I can't even say it properly. Anyway, it's supposed to say Tekan and I can't say it the wrong way, but that, that's spelt differently on pretty much every other map, except if you're on the train from Wakon Transport, who have also changed, that's part of us as well, who've also changed the cord at all, oh, sorry, the, the talking on the train. It says Tekan and correctly as well. And I think interestingly, um, it, was a, it wasn't a gift of a name because it was a gift of a name and, and it allowing us to use that name because outside, just outside in the, well, you can't see it, but there's a thing that says Takanini Village. So Kathleen was not worried. She worried about the fact that this is Takanini on the sign that says the shopping centre because this was a safe, you know, we've created a safe space for her ancestors' name to be used correctly. And so she was absolutely happy with it being used within and all the dialect of all the naming of places within the space to use their dialect wasn't really fussed about the sign outside didn't matter this was about the space here so she did a lovely quarter or about that at the um opening oh and now i just show you some pictures of our opening so there's kathleen wilson from um Te Akata, who i'm referring to and um Kaimatua ted nataki from natitama oho so um you know, relationships take ages. I happen to have known Ted for, I don't know, ever, for about 20 years. And, and you know, the conversation you've had over the years and, and it's just, for Nongatanga, the relationship building is, is super important. Um, uh, there is also, this is not a, this is just a pohatu, just a rock, but not a Modi stone as such, which is more the one that holds the spirit of a place. This, um, the, we were happy to, they gave us the um, pohatu, but, um, and they're the story of the chief of their ancestor and the chief which they wrote on the plaque um, was also unveiled on the opening day. So that also speaks to the ancestor. Oh, there's all the words. Um, I mentioned the use of the dialect to name spaces. Tipunamatauranga, uh, Tane Tewananga. Oh, I can see it on here. Um, and to Wainui Atane, which also speaks to the artwork which is within the space. Um, I'll get to that soon. Oh, there's Ted speaking. This is just kind of exact, just, just really showing. So when we work with mana whenua in Auckland, we're used to, you know, them being there at Blessings, at the, oh, there's Ted, Ted talking, Kathleen talking, that's the then mayor. He also spoke. <laughs> um, and we're sort of used, we, we're absolutely used. We always have a dawn karakia. Um, this is everyone gathering for the blessing and also sod turning. We keep the sod, we put it away um, safely and the building is built. And then we um, have a, always have a dawn blessing before the kaimahi or the workers, and we're all kaimahi. It's not a hierarchical thing. Um, this is mana whenua happening with us. And that's just, we're used to, that's like what we do all the time. And, but this, what I'm trying to get to very soon is that is the most basic thing that we do and very, very important and ceremonial. But sometimes we've been, you know, like that's the last we see of the iwi. And I'm, I'm exaggerating slightly for, um, it's a slightly hyperbole, hyperbole, but it can happen. So 
here, though, we had um, Kathleen, our area representatives on the project control group. We had them choosing architects. We had them on um, to, um, staff, because this was a new build, so we didn't have any old staff, other staff to bring in. We had to build a whole new team. They were part of the recruitment process, and anything else they wanted to be involved in, we just, you know, and that I could tell a long story about how what procurement actually thought of that, because, you know, but I won't. Um, it, you know, because it's unusual, basically, to have Ewe at the table all the way along and part of the decision making. Um, there's also some very clever people in Auckland who work as part of the Southern Initiative, which is, uh, and we've worked with them a lot. They've got super, super bright social enterprise, amazing um, people who have done a whole lot of work um, with us. And the, one of the outcomes, and I've got a lovely bibliography, which I can get at the end. So all these documents are available. Um, and But creating home was part of um, the other thing that we we had, wānanga, sorry, the, um, gatherings on marae, um, talking to matawaka and mana whenua, and what came out was five minimums of, of creating a home away from home in our libraries. This sounds really basic, but it actually isn't. So all, all we need is a welcoming space, a safe place for tamariki, that's children, a place to change baby, accessible kitchen facilities, and opportunities to connect with or just be around others. Sounds basic, right? However, I don't know that it is because I don't know why. Well, it should be a bit easier. Okay, I'll get back to creating home in a second. Um, <laughs> this is just another example of this. Is um, you notice that Kathleen's in there um, with a high vis vest, so she was totally part of the walking, walking the space, having a conversation. And what we were doing there actually is having a conversation about that blue and white bit there so there was a there's a blank wall um when we're staring at it you know we're running out of time no one has decided what to do with the blank wall it's because it's a design design build in a lease space at one point it was all glass and there was going to be something else upstairs but we've ended up three weeks to go in this blank white wall and so everyone's sort of staring at it <laughs> thinking shall we do a community artwork could we do a someone suggested a mirror ball or something and Kathleen said, well, could you just please put a map of the place with the right, with correct names on it? We went, oh, yes, <laughs> there's an idea. So the other architect, I mean, they were brilliant. The architect went, fine, how, we, we can make that happen and like, seriously, not very long. Um, and so there, yeah, I think it's one of the most best things, the most best um, about about the space so um everything spelled right to, to kanini wai mahia which is another um area of which we have a library and that has also changed um the name from clendon to wai mahia properly um kind of a, again a bit of a side side thing is we have uh also have tikiti rukuruku which is a, um, a cultural and identity program um, within auckland council that uh collects and tells unique stories of tamaki makoto so that te reo Māori can be seen, heard, learned and spoken. So that contributes to reclaiming Māori identity and restoration of mana and Māori, which is the Māori is life force, to the whenua, which is land, through the restoration of te reo Māori and traditional names and assorted narratives. Now that's a sort of an aside to Kiti Rukuruku, but our libraries are part of that. And it's a long process getting the stories and it's not about signage and naming and changing signs as such. It is about all that I just said. I mean, so this is also part of telling the stories of, of the whenua, the land, um, through particularly this map. We also, there is, um, uh, iwi wanted to tell stories um, of that, a cultural narrative that, that meant something to this iwi, Tane and the Baskets of Knowledge, which is quite a common um, story in, in Aotearoa. Um, where Tane went and got baskets of knowledge, sort of a long story actually. <laughs> anyway, and then he eventually got back through, got back down and bought the baskets of knowledge and put them in a store in a sacred storehouse. So, um, the iwi, um, the artist Johnson Wutihira is the artist that works um, with Te Akatai Ohua. And if you are in Tamaki Makoto, you have seen 
the motifs um, along the motorway. There's a number of artworks that he has done, which are, are throughout that um, that area of of Tamaki Makoto. And so uh, the artwork is embedded as the as part of the cultural narrative within that within the space. So that's just a different oh, different view of them. Uh, I'm trying to show you some architectural shots as well. Um, and the okay, this is a kitchen. So, Kai is a good Kai, which is food. Sorry, Kai is a Kai is a great connector. Um, one of the things is you accessible kitchen facilities. So, what we made as an accessible kitchen facility was a kitchen right in the middle of the library. So, you can't, oh, let's see a shot where you can. Uh, so, if you, you come in the door there and that's the kitchen there, I might just go back. Oh, and then. That's some, sorry, architectural shots of no people. Um, <laughs> hold on, I'll go back. <laughs> um, but the kitchen. So the Kai, so so in that space, it's a, it's completely public. So you can, um, it's it's also fully fitted out. So you can make a Kai and the staff all eat there. The um, community bring in food. There's always food there. You can just go in and get, get a Kai anytime you want. And it's all sharing. Um, we also do some... Um, back of the fridge uh, cooking lessons and community come in and um, the other day I was there and a woman was there making dumplings and just because she kind of felt like it and um, it's not there's no rule I mean the places are values based not policy and rules kind of place so I'll get to the I've already mentioned some of the values but I'll get to that as well so that is this is like the center of the library and the center of the space because it is like creating a home. You need a you need a kind of you need some pick people in this picture. However, hopefully you get the idea. Uh, that's another shot of it. Yes. Oh yes, sure. Um, other aspects of the build. Um, parenting room. Uh, this is where absolutely open. It's got a um, it's actually got a little microwave as well. Um, you can change baby and look after Tamariki, and it's actually kind of just. Just there, it's right in the library. Um, and that's really well used. Uh, there's a slide. Um, and it can be noisy or it cannot be noisy, but but Fano and community, uh, we, they keep the, we don't tell people to be quiet. The, if a community, it's how the community wants to use the space is how we kind of control the slide. And there's a beautiful picture. We have some gaming stuff. We have a consultant's room. I will just quickly speak to the recruitment process. I've I've spoken to it before, but to get we had bespoke position descriptions, which is also another long story of how we actually got that through PNC by kind of hook, thing by crook, and a co-papa Māori recruitment process. So just quickly on that, uh, we we got everyone who has um, wanted to work at Te Kanini into a room with the managers and whoever else was there, some Fano, some iwi, and we we just had some Fanongatanga, and everyone went around talked about why they wanted to. Work at work at Chikanini and why we were there and how what we were how we were all involved in it and then essentially we did have a kind of it wasn't really an interview but then we then we talked to people a little bit more individually and that's how we chose chose our awesome team um, and you didn't have to be able to, the seniors speak to the old Maori but um, it was really just around attitude to to language so people spoke in whatever their language was around the table uh, and we got an awesome team together who have now. Oh, there they are. There's some of them. Um, I'll just flip. <laughs> Everything's rooted in ind Indigenous practice. I won't go, but again, the value is based. The one other kind of cool thing is that there is no workroom. So there's no workroom in this library. Uh, Kai Mahi, they just hang out in the library. Could be in that space, could be in that space. Uh, could, <laughs> could be in that space. And probably just finally. So what that does is, so they just work, work out, put their um, laptops, just hang out, have meetings, um, and community can join if they want to. So there's programming. We've got lots of lots of examples where um, the staff are talking about what they could do, what we could do in the library, and the community just join in and, and have the quote it all straight away. Get the feed, we get the feedback straight away, what's happening. Um, they leave laptops just in the library. There's no security gates or security here. We sometimes do use guards in South Auckland, not at this space. It's embraced by community and it's kaupapa Māori, it's, far, it's all about whānau and the whānau is 
the community and the staff um, kai mahi who work there um so even though we love buildings the center Kotefano te po, toko manua o te whare, this whare, the central heart pole of the building is the family. So it is about, isn't all about the whare for sure. Kia ora. We've got time for one or two questions. We do have an afternoon tea break, so you can also talk hopefully, to Shannon and Kim during the afternoon to be great with some of your personal questions, but maybe one or two questions to share with the whole group, yes? Thank you so much. Um, I guess I'm trying to think of the, the way to word this. Um, so I work for the State Library here. Um, Melissa and I work in the Black Branch at the State Library, so the little black bit within the colonial bit. Um, and we work with a lot of public libraries and other libraries that are trying to do things like this. Um, and it always strikes me that part of the issue here is that we don't have very many of our mob in positions of authority, um, let alone staffing a whole library. And so we kind of get stuck in this place where we're trying to explain these values in a way that can then be kind of enacted without us. Um, I was just wondering, have you had experience setting all of this up for the non Maori people to run those spaces or do you think that having Maori staff is is really key to it? Kia ora, kia ora. Uh, well the other bit I was going to say is we have got some other another program called Kia ora Tofano where we're doing a Kia ora Tofano hub in another one of our sites but you, it's not repeatable you have to do this go through the entire same story and with the with the area that matter and you know it's taking us forever we've finally got we have got a tawaka kirawai a, a maori unit within, in Auckland, uh, within our department now um, but that's taken us 12 years we had a maori principal advisor forever and on our lead team but she didn't have any staff we had kai mahi at relatively junior positions out in the public in the libraries and finally we just went basically I said, <laughs> we're, gonna, we're going to bring my, that staff in, that, that staff into a, uh, they're not going to be dotted around. We've, we've given up on that. We're going to bring them into to, to Waka Ketaway, wrap, uh, wrap around them, and, and then it's just far more effective. So, and, and our staff just keep getting poached to other places. So it's taken us this whole 13 years of being in Auckland Council to get this amazing group. I should also mention that we have an awesome Nga Matarai, a Māori unit within council as well, but for our department with libraries and arts centres and community centres, um, we, we achieved that in July 2021. Um, so it felt like a, a biggie that Judith and I had been around that long, that, um, yeah, working on that. So I think your answer is, just kind of keep going and keep recruiting, and it's been 60 years and you know, old you know, so, yeah. It sounds like you're making some progress, but I know how you feel. <laughs> One more, yes. Really proud to say that uh, I lived in Auckland for 20 years. Um, I'm just basically from India for more 1996 to Auckland, and I stayed there for 20 years and yeah. working with Auckland libraries. I just want to share this um, response to that question. When I started working in Auckland um, with Auckland City Libraries, um, all the new recruits were introduced to theoretical, the document. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then we had to go through, you know, all the councils here, we go through the code of conduct courses. It's something like that. Every staff member who starts working there was introduced to the Maori culture and the main principles of Maori. So that's, that's, it's really good to get to understand what it is and how it is, what the importance is. So that actually pushes um, you to enjoy the culture and to be able to actually provide the services necessary. Thank you. Thank you. Kelda. Okay, we're having a break now, but if you do want to quickly grab Shannon or Kim or Annie who's back, <laughs> uh, please do. Thank you.